Welcome to Let's Get Writing. I'm your host, Catherine Musso. If you've been following our shows, you know that this is a show about writing, writing books, poems, plays, songs, you name it. I try to cover everything. And what we delve into is the creative process of how, how these works of art are made and what motivates people to do it and what kind of decisions and challenges they come across as they go through the process. And again, we're here today to share with you, and my guest today is Gemma Hickey. Gemma, welcome to Let's Get Writing. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's Thank a pleasure you. to have you here. And right on the table, we have your, your book, which mm -hmm. has just been published, Almost Feral. Yes. And we're going to delve into that somewhat. And, but let's just start by finding out about the whole process of how did this book come about, Gemma? Well, you know, I think this book has been in me for a long time, mm -hmm. um, certain parts of it anyway, but uh, it really kind of came to light for me as I was walking across the island uh, in July of 2015, four years ago, to raise uh, funds and awareness for Pathways, which is an organization I founded for survivors of clergy abuse. I was abused by a priest when I was younger, and um, like many people from the province who have been affected by this issue, um, I thought it was important to engage the public and uh, raise more awareness. So as I was walking, I was thinking. And when I'm thinking, I'm writing, you mm -hmm. know? And so um, I, um, that's basically how the book came to be. Um, as I was walking, those long periods of solitude on the highway, thinking back to my past and... Um, kind of integrating it with your present, what you felt in the environment. <coughs> that's what I felt as I'm going through the book. And Thank you. you blended it beautifully. Thank you so like much. You really, you really took us from being on the road with you mm -hmm. and then into your mind, and it just was so smooth the way it oh, went back and forth. Thank you so much. I, yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, it was, it was like that for me on the road in a way. I didn't want to do a chronological memoir of mm -hmm. a day-to-day -day walk, although I thought that some of the road narratives were really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wanted to symbolize the movement, and not just the movement from one side of the island to the other, the movement inward, reflecting on who I was as a person and who I was starting to become, who I was starting to remember in a way. You know, the book is really about, I mean, the book is about so many different things, but mainly about identity and not just identity um, in terms of being transgender, because by the time I end my walk, I decide to come out as transgender mm -hmm. and pursue hormone therapy. And, um, you know, so really in a way I, I feel like I walked from one side of the island to the other side of myself. But I wanted to take people with me on that journey because the journey really started when, when I took my first step, I think at nine months, you know, and, and uh, just the journey continues. Right. So, yeah. you, so uh, as you're walking and thinking and I mean a anyone knows and actually what a great idea if you <laughs> want to create a book <laughs> Thank you. because that isolation that <sighs> time to be with yourself and create a lot of great ideas come to mind mm -hmm. well how did you deal with that so you're walking and you had a few things on your back and I noticed you had a book of poetry by Al Pittman yeah you know, one I of the great Newfoundland poets yeah I had a few which I, that stayed with me when I read that you yeah. had that with you and you had extra shoes and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, when those ideas would come to you, how did you capture them? Because you're walking on the highway. Did you just stop it at night and write those down? How did that oh, ha happen for you? You know, I just uh, thought about them, and they stayed with me mm -hmm. until I was ready to write it out. And now it's been four years later, and, um, you know, my life has been very busy and... and uh, so I've had the, the, the time, I'm in grad school as well at Memorial, doing my master's in gender studies. So once my coursework finished this past term, mm -hmm. um, I sat down to really hammer the book out in, in three, four months. Really? Mm -hmm. In that short a period mm -hmm. of time? And you were able to keep all of that just so sharp in your, your mind? <coughs> yes, because that's the type of memory I have, you mm -hmm. know? I, um, I mean, I think, my memory, in part, makes me a writer, and uh, that's always been in me. I've always wanted to be a writer, mm -hmm. though I've been focused on numerous other things. Um, but I feel that um, those types of things that I experienced on the road with other people and within myself, they'll stay with me forever. Mm -hmm. So it was only a matter of time before I wrote them out on paper. Um, I don't think I was prepared for 
the amount of emotional excavation I had to do over the process of um, writing this book in such a short period of time. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I knew that it would be cathartic, mm -hmm. but a lot of things resurfaced for me, a lot of past trauma, but also, you know, when I realized I could use my trauma as wings instead of chains, there was really no limit to how high I could soar, and that's how I feel, and I think that that's the message I want to bring to people, that no matter what you do, you can get past it. You can get past it. No matter what happens to you, you know, you can do something with it. It can either make you or break you. Mm -hmm. And in my, in my case, I've, I've used it, hopefully, to help others, and, and that's always been my bottom line as an activist. Well, Gemma, in a very physical sense, when you were on that walk, uh, going across the island, it was at times you, you must have felt awful. I mean, your feet were swollen. <laughs> you, you know, as you're describing it, yeah. it was almost, it, it was cathartic in itself, that whole process. Mm -hmm. did, did you ever want to give up on that? How did you? Um, no, there was never, it was never a choice for me to, to give up. I'm not a giver-upper. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to crawl back to that memorial. <coughs> I ended my walk at the right. memorial, the Mount Cash Memorial in St. John's, and I was going to crawl back there if I had to. Um, I was in a tremendous amount of pain uh, during the first um, week or two of the, of the walk, uh, especially the stretch from Stevenville to Corner Brook. I mean, I could barely put one foot in front of the other. But that's why the poem goes in and out of these essays, because I remember things about my past that really kept me going and gave me fuel to, to keep on going. And being in my mind and thinking about those memories really took me away from the physical pain that I was feeling. And I could think back about things and keep my mind steady. And that carried me through in many ways. Of course, I received so much support from people mm -hmm. across the island. They were stopping and honking and waving and, and um, hugging me and just embracing me and many people told me about their own trauma and their experiences being survivors of clergy sexual abuse or being related to someone I mean it was so rampant here on the island that that gave me strength too <coughs> but those stories weren't mine to tell as such but they stayed with me and they stay with me to this very day it was easier to carry them as I was walking mm -hmm. but when I stopped my walk and I was still you know I still I still am haunted by by all those stories of pain, but I do hope that uh, the book helps people in, in the same way that it helped me in terms of showing a movement through, a process through pain and on the other side in terms of healing. I really mm -hmm. hope that. I'm, I'm actually donating the royalties, half the royalties I make, um, to Pathways. From and the sales of and the Pathways, again, let's just... Uh, tell people again about that and what you've been doing because that's certainly been a wonderful initiative. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, it's for survivors of clergy abuse and I founded it back in 2013. Um, and, you know, it's taken me uh, all over the world. My, my work has been gaining recognition all over the world and I was in Rome lobbying with other survivors in, uh, in uh, during the pa Papal Summit and, and also just recently now in Cornwall, Ontario, uh, meeting with, uh, with bishops there and survivors, mediating meetings between them and uh, calling on them to release names of the credibly accused. So, um, you know, my work has uh, continued. There's been abuse claims coming out all over the world since I've done the mm -hmm. walk. And I knew that back when I did the walk in 2015 that we had only really scratched the surface. Um, but getting back to writing and, mm -hmm. and back to the Newfoundland mm -hmm. influence, um, as an islander, you know, I really clung to poets like uh, Al Pittman and Des Walsh and Agnes Walsh on the on the road. I, I carried a, a bunch of books with me and oftentimes I'd fall asleep with them in my arms or I'd take, you know, various books with me on the highway in my knapsack in case I needed a, a lift, you know, a literary lift and mm -hmm. uh, and it was, uh, you know, they're, they're really important to me, those types of books and I've always read poetry and, and written poetry so um, they helped me along my way as well. And you had good support as well behind you. Your your mother and I think your uncle were there on the road with you. And yeah, that was interesting. I mean, there was no way. My mom is very determined, and mm -hmm. uh, you know she's very beautiful like yourself, and very um, she has a, a presence about her. And and there was no convincing her not to come, because of course I was 38, so I didn't know how it would work in a small um, camper. 
Right. Yeah. So uh, it was interesting to uh, to experience that and uh, have her parent me again at 38. You know, she was telling me to get up out of bed, <laughs> put my laundry in the basket. Hey, listen, moms <laughs> never, <laughs> never <laughs> stop that, and kids never stop resenting that we never stop doing it. I know. It was like I was on my walk. I planned the walk. <laughs> I worked hard for for the walk. I wasn't gonna mess it up. But you know, moms being moms. Anyway, so that was fun. There's some um, some funny. Uh, narratives in there about uh, my mother and her brother who's a retired mechanic and uh, he um, you know he he offered to come along on the walk with us as well so that was great um, I had them with me for three weeks and then we changed up teams um, but uh, yeah I mean it was certainly uh, we had some moments there but I, I had a, I did a lot of walking on the highway so I credit my mother uh, really to uh, getting me out on the highway quicker to, mm. to walk more stretches because uh, you know, it was a bit tense sometimes in the camper, but but always filled with so much love. Yeah, that's wonderful. And as you were as you were walking and thinking, I mean, did you picture a book at that time? I'm thinking you didn't. I, I was, or did you? No, I didn't actually picture a book at that time. I knew that something would come of it. Mm -hmm. um, poetry, whatever, in terms of. Um, writing I think I was leaning more towards poetry at the time because that's that's just the way that I am poetry mm -hmm. is my go-to but I knew something would come out of it and I knew that I would have to do something with the experiences but I just didn't want to do a memoir or um, a book about a walk like other books about walks mm -hmm. I wanted to do something really different and so that's why the double narrative is in there mm -hmm. the walk is the overarching framework of the book but it's really not about the walk itself it's about you know the walk journey inward and let's c and, and that brings me to the, the title almost yeah. feral yeah and uh, I thought too that's an interesting title how did you come to that well <coughs> I was out on the road for a month and mm -hmm. living in a camper and uh, we were moving from campsite to campsite and the the province uh, at the time, the provincial government, uh, the PC government uh, sponsored the walk. They were our primary sponsor. So we had the uh, provincial campsites uh, free of charge. So, um, no, I was by the end or the middle of the walk, I mean, I was really rugged looking. And, um, you know, I, I, but I felt really this, this feeling of near wilderness. You know, I was walking through all these beautiful landscapes and, and, and just feeling, feeling nature in, in a way that I hadn't experienced it before. And uh, when I was sitting uh, by a brook taking a, a, a moment's uh, break, uh, as I was walking through Tiernover Park, a coyote mm -hmm. came up to me. And I didn't realize that it was a coyote at first. I thought it was a fox from far off. And then it approached me and it got closer and it got closer again. And then it got closer again. And I realized it was a coyote. I didn't have a stick. I didn't want to suddenly move. There were no cars on the highway. I was in the park, so it wasn't that busy. Mm -hmm. So I stood up, and I stared it down, and it walked away. It just went away. And so um, I joked in the book that I looked so feral that I wasn't appetizing. <laughs> I was almost feral. Um, but really, it's about being near wilderness and feeling like you're not categorized because I move through so many different ways of thinking and being about identity in the book right. and so when you feel like you're not cat categorized you feel like you can't be summed up or you don't fit in which is a feeling that followed me all of my life mm -hmm. people would often consider you uncivilized and so um, that's why the title is called Almost Feral for that and so many other reasons really yeah. that are in the book but I won't yeah. go into all of them but that's just one one um, situation where I do mention the title and yeah and, and I think it uh, in some ways it may have reflected how you were feeling too in mm. terms of dealing with all the other <coughs> parts of you exactly that yeah. I am just free I and am just wild and free to be who I want to be. Exactly. You summed yeah. it up perfectly. And and that feeling was it was an incredible feeling after I finished that walk. And I, I certainly felt free. And I feel free now. And yeah. I feel I can sense that. Yeah. Yeah, I can sense that kind of relaxed energy. Here I am and this is me. 
and uh, like it or not. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I think there are a lot of people who need to, to see someone like you, yes who has found that comfort and acceptance of self. Well, it's been a long road for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I just love the cover image. I, I just mm -hmm. love the cover image. The cover image was donated to, to me by uh, a friend of mine who's a very talented photographer, David Howells. He also did my author photo in the book. And, uh, you know, I think the image is, sums it up perfectly. And, of course, the graphic designer at Breakwater, Rhonda Malloy, I love her little signature here. Mm -hmm. You know, these little types of, um, you know, the way she worded, well, the way she placed my uh, name on the side of the mm -hmm. road like that. And inside the it book. It's almost like a sign. Well, yeah, it looks no, no, just, no, it just look, looks so Because that did, that did catch my attention, the yeah, way your absolutely. name is there. And then in the book, she, um, you know, she separates the road narratives by having a background. Yeah, you know? it was, it's really nice. So I thought that that was a nice touch as well. And, and the team at Breakwater Books are just And fantastic. again, you know, there's so much that goes into a book. As a consumer, you pick up a book and you're going in and you're looking at books. So covers are yeah. important, believe it, it or not. I guess, it, 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 you know, they're in areas of bookstores, mm -hmm. this topic, this topic, and so on. But covers are so important in how things are, are done. You can write the best book in the world and mm -hmm. perhaps have the worst cover and no one picks it up mm. and that's on. But um, I, think, I think hopefully we're intriguing people to want to, to read and look at this. You did it in such a short period of time. You got up, what was your day like? Oh, you know, tell me, intense, I mean, it was a intense. long day. I, I mean, that, I know what it feels like. You're trying to take all these words and thoughts. And did you work with an outline? Tell me a bit about your writing process. Well, I didn't work with an outline as such, but um, once I finished up my last course for my, um, for, for my master's, I, um, I just delved right into the writing. And I had to travel uh, as well. I, I went to Japan and Rome, and I missed about a month of uh, my grad seminar. So when I got back, I had to focus solely on that writing mm -hmm. academically. And writing academically is very different than writing creatively. Um, so I almost feel sometimes I'm talking in a different language when I'm writing or talking academically. Mm -hmm. you know? So once that school was clued up, I, uh, I work full time, of course. I, I'm the executive director for the Love of Learning, and I, I run Pathways uh, voluntarily. So you know I had to go to work every day, and I had to keep up with my volunteer commitments. So at the end of the day or first thing in the morning before I'd head into the office, I would write a thousand words a day plus. Now, a thousand words was my limit, but if I did more than that, great. Mm -hmm. But I had to hammer out a thousand words a day. And so, um, and that's what I did. I just did it every day because I had that deadline and I treated it like the deadline on the road. I had mm -hmm. 30, 30 days or so to finish this. I had to break it down, you know, and, uh, and that's what I did. I just looked at it like that and uh, remember the strength and the dis you know the discipline and determination i had at that point to well there's something to the, the continuity <coughs> of just staying focused and staying at it that i think gives gives impetus it gives you energy it keeps your thoughts focused mm -hmm. and it, it actually can work well yeah yeah mm -hmm. i believe it can and, and it did for me it did, you know, yeah. it did it really did and i'm really proud of the book um, you know, I, I, I loved working with the editor of Breakwater, James Langer. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you next about the editing pro project. Well, part of it. How did that? How did that go? Well, for me, it uh, went a bit differently than other people. Um, I went into the office of Breakwater mm -hmm. when I had some free time, and if James had any suggestions, I would be right there with him um, because of the deadline. And because I had to go to Japan and Rome within a short period of time, um, we had to push the deadline you know, for my book to come out. Mm -hmm. Originally it was going to come out in June, and it came out in the fall. So, so I, in the end, I ended up going into the Breakwater office and working directly with James, you know, so that uh, we could get it done quick. And it was a, just a, a wonderful experience. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the adrenaline rush, too, of, of getting it done and, and just... Were there ever uh, any times when you didn't agree with with something that was suggested? Did you have to work through anything like that? Or were you pretty much um, on sync? I trust uh, James. Mm -hmm. I, I loved James' writing. So for me, I felt like he and I were in sync. Um, mm -hmm. There really weren't, my writing, he said, was clean, so there weren't many mm -hmm. um, changes as such. But um, he made some suggestions, and I thought they were great ones. So, you know, there wasn't, 
there was no conflict between us. Let's put it that way. Okay. It was enjoyable yeah. all the way through. Excellent. Um, yeah, so it was a great experience overall. So you did that, and then how long did it take from the time that you had your edited version to we have a book right here in front of us? Um, I believe it was the end of September that went to print, and then here we are. Yeah. So it's pretty pretty good turnaround <laughs> because that industry sometimes can be ponderous. Yeah. It can't take time. And sort of sort of they're planning their books and how they're going to do things. Mm -hmm. um, would you? What advice would you give to others in writing your book? Is there anything that you feel that people could benefit from knowing from your experience? Read everything. What's the best advice? My dad used to give me that advice when I was mm -hmm. a kid. And just both my parents, you know, always read to me and always told me to read. And I find in order to to write something, you need to think about other people's ideas and, and, and learn, you know. And I think reading whatever you can, whatever you like, that's that's really good advice, I think. Also getting involved in the writing community wherever you live. You know, I used to be the president of the Writers Alliance in St. Mm -hmm. John's and, and uh, just being around other writers really uh, helped to inspire me and uh, and just write every day. You can write every day no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's uh, something that you you have to give yourself the time, at least the, the mental space, to be able to think. If you can write during the day, great, but you need to give yourself that time to think because, you know, everybody's so busy and hectic. Uh, yeah. that, you know, you really got to kind of get into the zone. So thinking is just as important as the writing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, I had this book in me since The Rock. I've been writing it in my head. So that's why I was able to kind of put it on paper. I understand everything you're saying. A lot of stuff happens in the head. Yeah. And, I, I, and I think you've hit, a, hit on some great advice here, but also this element of people not having that time, that, mm -hmm. that we're never shut down mm -hmm. anymore. That's and true. I feel writing is a bit of an, an introverted, isolated time. And if you, if, you, if you can't shut it out, if you can't shut it down, it's very hard to get in that zone. Well, it is, it is difficult. I mean, I have a, a partner that I need to be present to. I have so many other commitments mm -hmm. I need to be present to. Um, but it's important to just carve out that time. And, you know, it can be done. Uh, I'm oh, a very busy person. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, you just got to do it. And you got to want it, too, you know. Well, I know you mentioned music <sighs> a bit in the book, you know. Uh, is there a music that you write with or do you write quietly? Quietly for me mm -hmm. and, and being in front of um, a scene, like a lake or a pond or a, a tree, mm -hmm. you know, those types of things. Um, I need quiet to, to write, to kind of sink into myself. But I love to just lift my head up from the page and look out and just see the beautiful landscapes I really feel connected to, especially after my walk. Mm -hmm. You mentioned For the Love of Learning. Let's mm -hmm. just share a bit more about that with people. Yeah, so I've been the executive director of this arts-based charity for youth uh, now for a decade, I believe. And it's just really the best job in the world because I get to work with young people who are really struggling mm -hmm. and, you know, they don't have any direction. And so we guide them in a way that we increase their employability through these arts projects that they get involved in and hopefully their self-esteem. Um, we pair them up with artists depending on their interests and then they get to put a film credit or a, a publication credit on their resume or an art exhibit credit on their mm -hmm. resume like these types of things you know and so we like to think that there's you know there's obviously more ways to learn and so many youth who don't respond to traditional ways of learning um, you know can come to us and we can uh, we can we can come up to their level and work with them so it's really a lot of fun you know we've had Joel Thomas Hines, Greg Malone, Ron Hines, Pamela Morgan, you know, the list goes on and on and on of, of all the artists, uh, you know, from the province that we've had involved with the organization working side by side with our young people. So it's, it's really, really fun work and I'm really sounds, proud of it. It sounds like it. It sounds amazing and, and what a great way to reach people. Mm -hmm. um, is it outside St. John's? I got to ask that because so many <coughs> things I'm going to, if it's not, I'm going to challenge you to get it going in <laughs> well, here. Well, we have done, um, <laughs> we, I have done, uh, you know, workshops outside of St. John's, yeah. but it is, we're located in St. John's. We're government funded and uh, we're located, we have central places. Uh, our offices are located in St. John's. We do direct service work too, so if people want to come in, you can't write on a, if you don't have a full stomach. So, you know, we have some food there. Yeah, and yeah. We have, you know, a warm space and, and it's welcoming, non judgmental. We have computers there, phones, if, if you know, young people need to use them and, and uh, that type of thing. So, you know, um, 
holistic in their approach, but uh, mm -hmm. I have done workshops um, in different parts of the island, well, writing I'll keep, workshops. I'll keep that in mind. Absolutely, I'll, I'll I'd love to partner with you in some there way. There you go. Yeah. And you know, before we wrap up, um, how can people reach you? Do you um, what social? channels are you on and how do people reach out? Well, I'm on Facebook and mm -hmm. Instagram and Twitter. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm around, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, you know, as accessible as I can be. I do get a, a high volume of uh, messages based on all the things I'm involved in, but, you know, I try to respond to people when I can and, and um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. Easy ways to find an yeah. email perhaps, so would you want to share? Or? Um, Gemma M. Hickey at gmail.com is, is my email and, um, and my, um, my, I believe my Twitter feed and my Instagram feed are at Just Be Gemma and on Facebook I'm Gemma M. Hickey. Um, yeah, so I, uh, people can reach me those ways. And Just Be Gemma, that was a documentary, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. uh, Peter Walsh, great guy. He, yeah. he directed uh, and produced this documentary through his company, Night Island Communications, uh, in partnership with CBC and the Documentary Channel. And that, that aired a couple of years ago, and that's about my, um, my transformation in terms of gender. And, and uh, yeah, I believe that that's still on, uh, uh, available to, uh, to the public on CBC Gem. On CBC Gem, yeah. I have that one, yeah. Well, if people want to know more, just be Jenna. Gemma, <laughs> thank you for just being Gemma here. <laughs> uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, you know, you're such a warm person, and it's oh, been such a joy so to meet you and well, talk goes to both you. Ways. Have a great tour across the island, thank you. and I hope that a lot of people check into um, Almost Feral. And that's your Let's Get Right for now, and we'll see you again soon. We'll delve into more parts. <laughs> Have a great week, everyone.